Mr. President, I want to speak on the item that we're on, the National Defense, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, by taking a look at the condition of the world today, and this is an important time to do it as we enter the end of this year and we begin to look forward to the new year, uh, to take a moment to take a snapshot of the world and the threats that exist around us and the complexities of the world, uh, because I think they're directly on point as to what our military capabilities are going to need to be in the 21st century. I know that the tendencies have often been, on a number of occasions, just in my lifetime, where we have tried to take, for lack of a better term, what's known as a peace dividend, after the end of the Cold War, for example, and then again uh, after the events of 9-11. The idea that somehow the threats around the world and the challenges we face, it somehow ebbed, and that it was time to nation build at home. And I'm always in favor of nation building at home. The problem is that now, today, in the 21st century, more than ever, there is no such thing as a remote problem. There is no such thing as any issue that is of major importance abroad that doesn't somehow impact us here at home. And this is true more than ever. I think this has always been true, but it has never been more true than it is today because of the global nature of our economy. And as you look around the world, and I wanted to take a brief moment to go over some of the parts of the world, you start to see what the need for American leadership is and the need for a strong national defense capability on the part of the United States, how important it is in this new global economy. Let's begin by looking at the Middle East, the most troubled region of the world, and that's been true for a very long time. Uh, we begin by talking about the negotiations that are going on with Iran. And look, I, I would hope, we all do, I think, to wake up one day to the news that Iran has decided to walk away from sponsoring terrorism, that Iran has walked away from its desire to blow up Israel, that Iran has rejected the human rights violations that it commits against its own people, and that Iran has abandoned its nuclear ambitions. We would all love to see that happen. That is the ideal outcome. It is also, frankly, the least likely. The truth is that while we shouldn't root against the negotiations that are going on with Iran, we shouldn't be naive enough to believe that they have a serious chance of success for a couple very different simple reasons. The first is because I think Iran looks at what's happened with North Korea, a country that barely has an economy, not even a country in the sense that you would think it has a government. It's really an, an area of land run by a criminal syndicate. And they have seen how North Korea, because it has a nuclear weapon, has been able to be immune to international pressures up to a certain point. And then Iran looks to Libya and they look to Iraq and they say, look what happened to the people that don't have nuclear weapons. And so I am convinced that the Supreme Leader wants that nuclear capability. Whether he'll ever actually build the weapon or not may not be something they've decided yet, but the ability to build that weapon, I have no doubt that that's what they want. And I have no doubt, and I believe the administration knows this to be true, that they've gone into these negotiations with a very clear objective, and that is, we want you to get rid of negotiators, we want you to get rid of as many sanctions as possible without agreeing to any irreversible concessions. And it's an interesting plan because their idea is get rid of the sanctions, we'll do what we need to do in the short term, whatever that may be, as long as they're not irreversible, and then at some point in the future we'll restart the weapons program. It's going to be easier for Iran to restart the weapons program than it's going to be for the United States and the nations of the world to reimpose sanctions. So I think they've figured that out and that's what their mandate has been, but even that has its limits. Because when we look to these negotiators, and there's a history of this when you look to these negotiators, there have been times in the past where Iranian negotiators might have agreed to something at the table, and then they have to come back and pull the offer, because when they take it to the Supreme Leader, he says no. And we have to understand the Supreme Leader is an isolated individual. This is not a person that travels the world or interacts with other national leaders of other nations. This is a person who is an ideologue, a religious fanatic. And I don't care what the negotiators, uh, negotiators agree to or what the president of Iran agrees to. It ultimately is the supreme leader's decision. And I hate to say this, but they are not going to agree to any sort of deal that is good for the national security of the United States. That's, that, that I believe to be true. And we need to be prepared for that. And I hope one of the first items we will take up in this chamber in the new year, in the new Congress, is a bill to require congressional authorization for any deal. And I think we should also consider putting in place sanctions for the day when the, that deal fails. In the meantime, as we talk about this and those negotiations are going on, 
and Iran has already acquired a concession on the part of the West that they can leave in place some level of the infrastructure they need to enrich uranium and reprocess plutonium. In the meantime, they're still expanding their missile capability. They're still sponsoring terrorism all over the world. They're still deeply embedded and aligned with Shia militias in Iraq that pose a danger to the United States. And I'll touch upon that in a moment. And they still have plans to one day destroy Israel. So we should not be naive about the situation with Iran. And I hope that in the new year, more clarity will come to that. The second issue that directly touches upon our national security is the conflict in Iraq and Syria with regards to ISIL, ISIL. The speed by which they have spread throughout two countries. And their goals are very simple. The goal of ISIL is to, Islam, is to establish an Islamic caliphate that stretches from Europe, literally from Spain, all the way through the Middle East, into India and Afghanistan, and into North Africa. That is their very clear goal. They've said so. That is their plan, and it began in Syria and it spread into Iraq, and they made some pretty impressive gains before they started getting hit from the air. But even with that, they are the best funded and best armed terrorist organization in modern history. We already are beginning to see the spread of ISIL. One place to keep an eye on is Libya. They control an entire province in Libya, an affiliate of theirs, a group that has pledged allegiance to them, now controls an entire province in Libya. Here's what's dangerous about that. For a group like this to prosper and grow, they need an ungoverned space. They need a piece of territory where no one is shooting at them, where no one is contesting their presence, when they have no one to fight against them. That's what they need. That's why Al-Qaeda was able to grow so fast in, the, in, in Afghanistan, because the Taliban gave them that ungoverned space. That's why ISIL was able to grow so quickly out of Syria and into Iraq, because they were able to carve out an ungoverned space where the Syrian government wasn't. In Libya, they have no one to fight. There is no functional government right now. There is no rival rebel groups to shoot at them. And they are going to use that ungoverned space to grow their capability. In fact, it would not surprise me, unfortunately, if in a few months, maybe a year, the hub of ISIL's activities are located largely in that province of Libya and beyond. By the way, ISIL's presence isn't just a threat to Iraq and Syria. Their goals, their immediate threats as well to the Kingdom of Jordan, a critical U.S. ally. And if they're a threat to Jordan, they're a threat to Israel and ultimately to Saudi Arabia. They're a threat to Turkey already. They're a threat to Lebanon. And as I said, they're present in North Africa as we speak. This is a very dangerous development and it must be dealt with seriously. We also can't anticipate the alliances that ISIL might make, because you have to understand what's happening. As they make these gains or supposed games, they've also become very good at propaganda. And they are convincing young, radicalized individuals, including here in the United States, that they are the preeminent jihadist group on the planet, that they are the most successful jihadist group on the planet, that they will inevitably succeed, that they are an insurmountable force. And they are convincing people to abandon other groups and join them. They're convincing donors to stop giving money to other groups and give to them. And we don't know what this is going to develop into, but you could foresee in the very near future where other groups begin to align themselves with them just to remain relevant. By the way, as a side note, there's an additional danger to ISIL spread. And that is that the other Al-Qaeda-linked groups, the other jihadist groups in the world who are now losing donors and losing recruits are now pressured or feel an urgency to go out and carry out some spectacular attack, like here in the homeland or against American interests or air travel somewhere. They now have an interest in carrying out a spectacular attack because they need to do something to re-attract donors and re-attract members. But back to my original point, the danger here is that these groups, new groups, in order to remain relevant and not lose their fighters, may decide they're going to pledge allegiance to ISIL. And the host of groups that are already exploring that are dangerous. The Taliban in Afghanistan, the Taliban in Pakistan, the Haqqani network that are both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And there are other groups in North Africa as well that at least nominally have pledged some level of allegiance and support for what ISIL is doing. We need to keep an eye on this threat because a year ago, if I had stood on this floor and said we need to take ISIL very seriously, no one would know what I was talking about. That's how quickly this threat has spread. And we have no idea what it could morph into in the next few years 
not to mention the next few months. By the way, one additional point that I want to make for us to keep an eye on. The city of Mosul has a university with a significant research capability. And one thing for us to be very cautious about is that ISIL is not using that university and its research capabilities to develop rockets or, God forbid, chemical weapons or even a dirty bomb. And that's something to keep an eye on in the months and weeks to come. Another example of the complex national security threats that our nation faces. Our ally in Israel, their struggles and their challenges are well documented. It begins with Iran. We talked about this. It is the single greatest threat facing Israel today is the prospect of a nuclear Iran and what it can mean to Israel's security in the long term. They face a very difficult challenge with the Palestinian, the Palestinian Authority. There was a poll I read about this morning that talked about a large majority of people, Palestinians, who believe that it is morally right to kill Israelis, to kill Jews. Now, I'm not saying to you that I believe all Palestinians think that, but we have, it bears noting what that poll found. It should not surprise us when the educational institutions of the Palestinian Authority, not to mention what's being taught in Gaza, teach people that not only is it right, it's heroic to kill Jews and to be an anti-Semite. And then they're being pressured, including by this administration, Israel is, to enter into a peace agreement with these, with, with these individuals, with those so-called leaders. How can you enter into a peace agreement with people that want to destroy you? How could you possibly enter into a peace agreement with an organization that wants to eradicate you? What are you going to negotiate? The terms of your destruction? I don't know of any nation on earth that, would, wouldn't want, that, that wants peace more than Israel does. What do they have to gain from this constant conflict? But how can you have peace with an organization, with a group that is committed to your destruction? And instead of saying, Israel, your number one problem right now, we know what it is. It is the threat of an Iranian nuclear weapon. This administration and some political leaders, even in this chamber, believe that we should be pressuring them that their number one objective should be into some sort of a peace agreement with an organization that wants to, to destroy them, that, won't, that in some quarters won't even recognize their right to exist. An organization that harbors individuals who deny that Jews were ever present on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is absurd. And of course, the, I would just encourage them to do a little archeological research to confirm the longstanding Jewish presence in the region. Suffice it to say that Israel is our strongest ally in the region. It is everything we wish the Middle East was, a prosperous free enterprise economy, a stable democracy with a vibrant political process, and a loyal friend of the United States and international forums. I wish there were more countries in the world like that. We should do everything we can to support Israel, and we should stop putting pressure on them. Because every time that we put pressure on them on these things and we create daylight between the United States and Israel, we imperil their security and we encourage their enemies to become even more aggressive. The last point I would make about Israel, let there be no doubt there is a global effort to delegitimize their right to exist as a Jewish state. It's infiltrated throughout the press in Europe and you're starting to see it rear its ugly head in academia here in the United States. We should not let that stand. We should speak out against it and condemn it for what it is. As if the Middle East was not complicated enough, you turn your focus to Europe and the threat that Russia now poses. Interestingly enough, a year and a half ago, the Mitt Romney, the former governor of Massachusetts, the Republican presidential nominee, said that Russia was our most serious geopolitical threat in the short term. He was universally mocked by elitists in the press even by some here in Washington, many here in Washington. It turns out he was right, as were many of us who were saying the same thing. The truth is that Vladimir Putin, many, many years ago, concluded that the United States was a threat to Russia. Many years ago concluded that he wanted Russia to re be reestablished as, as a world power, and that the only way he could achieve that is by confronting the United States and being seen as a counterbalance to the United States on the global stage. And you see that in place after place, in international forums, when it comes to Syria. On issue after issue, Russia is against us because they believe, Putin believes, that it gives them relevancy on the global stage. But there's a second issue here, and do not take this lightly. 
The Russians honestly believe. You know, you and I don't spend all day obsessed about Russia. We don't spend all night thinking the Russians are going to invade us. But they do. There are leaders in the Russian government that believe that the United States wants to, wants to get into a military conflict with them. And they increasingly believe that now more than ever. You can see it in the military moves that they're making. These are not just provocations. This is an all-out change to their defense posture, to the, their, the, their defense theory, a defense theory that is increasingly looking like a Cold War one, a defense theory that is increasingly looking like they need to have the ability to prevent a U.S. first strike or somehow to be able to react to a U.S. first strike. I know for us it sounds absurd that the U.S. would ever launch a nuclear attack against Russia, but there are Russian leaders at very high levels that believe that that's plausible, and you're seeing it rear its head every part of the world. Not a day goes by that there's not a report of a Russian intrusion here or a submarine appearing somewhere or, 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 or airplane, Russian bombers that have been intercepted by NATO or even the United States. These are not just provocations or muscle flexing. This is a change in their defense theory. And it's a very dangerous change. Not to mention the fact that I believe that the evidence now exists that Russia is in violation of multiple treaties that they have signed with the United States. And there needs to be consequences for that. And then, of course, as part of that strategy, they believe that they need strategic depth, which means they need all the countries that border them, especially the former Soviet republics, to be in their camp. They don't want anyone near them turning towards the West. And the best example of that is what's happened in Ukraine. What's happening in Ukraine is easy to understand. As Ukraine turned westward, Russia said that was unacceptable. They invaded Crimea and took it. And they are now engaged openly in a conflict with the Ukraine. And, and by the way, an outrageous one. First of all, Russian troops have entered Ukrainian territory. Maybe there was disguised as something else. But Russian troops have made incursions into Ukrainian territory and carried out combat operations against Ukrainian armed forces. The Russians are supplying the Ukrainians with weapons and armored vehicles. Now, they'll claim, no, these armored vehicles are armored vehicles that we seized. And they're clever about the armored vehicles that they supply them with. They're only supplying them with armored vehicles that look like the ones that, uh, that the Ukrainians already have in their current stockpiles. But they are arming, equipping, and training Ukrainian separatists. And their goal is to achieve one of two things. Their first objective, plan A, is to force Ukraine because of the pressure they're putting on them through these separatists, because of the economic levers that they hold on a very fragile Ukrainian economy through energy and exports and so forth, their first objective is to force Ukraine into a federation system of government. Basically a system of government that gives those eastern provinces and areas more autonomy. Because that will keep the country sufficiently divided so that it can never turn towards Europe and the West. If that doesn't work, however, then plan B that they're perfectly comfortable with is to freeze the status quo, to basically freeze the current conflict as the status quo for the long term. That for the next 15 or 20 years, there will be armed and trained separatists supported by Russia carrying out combat operations against the Ukrainian government in the eastern parts of the country. Plan A is the Federation. Plan B is to freeze the status of the current conflict. That's a reality that we're facing. Now, what's interesting here is that, this, and, and, and here's what Russia's banking on. What they're banking on is that the sanctions that have been imposed against their economy will not be sustained. That eventually, as after a couple of years, Europe will say, okay, you know, it's time to accept what's happened here and move on, and the sanctions will be lifted. In fact, that's what Putin's probably telling his inner circle and the people around him. Don't worry, we're going to get through this. These sanctions will eventually be lifted off of us, and everything will be back to normal. But those sanctions are hurting right now. I would hope that those sanctions don't fall apart. I would hope that the European nations understand what a direct threat this poses to them if Russia can just invade a country and take it over. But time will tell. I think a strong American leadership is critical. I think in reinvigoration of NATO is critical. And that's why it's so important that we focus on our defense capabilities. But that's what Putin's telling everyone around him. Don't worry about these sanctions. They're going to be gone in a while. We're going to get through this. Interesting, to give you some insight into, into Putin, the inner circle around him, the elites that are closest to him, they're being shielded from the impact of these sanctions to a certain point. 
In fact, one of the people, Igor Sechin, who was specifically sanctioned by the sanctions that were passed here and in Europe, he actually convinced Putin to indict an energy rival of his, take his property and his assets, and give it to Igor Sechin as compensation. That's how cynical this has become. So the elites that surround and are closest to Putin, they're being protected by the impact of the sanctions. But everybody else is paying a terrible price, not the least of which is the people. And I also think there's clear evidence here that Putin is increasingly isolated in terms of who he listens to, who he takes advice from, who he consults with. And it's going to have a devastating impact on Russia. Next year, their economy is predicted to contract. And yet, despite this, just to give you a true indication of where Russia's headed, and what should give us insight into where we should be headed, is that despite this contraction of their economy, despite the collapse of oil prices, which has been devastating to their economy, Putin just announced budget cuts throughout every part of their government, except for one, the one part of their budget they're holding harmless, military spending. And I hope that gives you some insight into where they're headed. And by the way, my last point on Russia, they're increasingly present in the Western Hemisphere. They're actively seeking lease agreements with Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, to be able to have naval assets and aircraft stationed in our own backyard in the Western Hemisphere. Let's talk about Asia for a moment, another place that poses some very significant national security and military implications for the United States. I talked about North Korea earlier. I think it bears repeating. North Korea doesn't have a government. It is a nation or it is a territory that is governed by a criminal syndicate run by an insane and erratic leader. But an insane and erratic leader with nuclear weapons. An insane and erratic leader that is developing long-term, long-range missile capabilities. And an insane and erratic leader that may end up overestimating his military capabilities and miscalculate and trigger a dispute with South Korea that could quickly escalate and implicate the United States, who has a very strong and important military uh, arrangement and defense agreement arrangement with South Korea and our allies in the South. It bears watching. Let's focus for a moment on China. First of all, we cannot ignore their aggressive territorial claims against both the Philippines and Japan. Interestingly, they picked on the Philippines first, a nation that doesn't much have much of a military to speak of. And this is the first nation that they've gotten into this sort of conflict with. But they have them also with Japan and with Vietnam, and they've been pretty aggressive about it. And to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about history. For thousands of years, China was the dominant nation in that region. And for them, the last 100 years, 200 years, is an aberration. And their increasing assertiveness is an indication that they believe that it's time to go back to normal, which is their dominance of the region. Their dominance, by the way, doesn't mean they're going to invade these countries and take them over. They're not going to invade the Philippines. They're not going to invade Japan. What they believe is that all these countries should be tributary states. That all these countries should fold underneath Chinese leadership. That all these countries should recognize that China's big and they're small. And that they should listen to China's directives and orders. And so you see the Silk Road Initiative. You see them trying to come up with an alternative to the other global institutions that have served the world so well since the end of World War II. They want to displace the United States and the global order that existed since the end of World War II with their own order, run by China for Russia, China's advantage. And that begins with territorial claims. The next time you have a chance to see in some Chinese passports, they have a map that indicates something called the nine dash line. The nine dash line is what they think the world really looks like in terms of territories. And if you look at what that means, they basically believe the entire South China Sea is their territory. And that's why they've made these aggressive moves against these islands. And let me tell you how the strategy works. They send fishermen to these areas to fish or others to exploit resources. The other countries send out their Coast Guard to defend it. They send their Coast Guard or Navy to push back. And they basically show you, even if you wanted to fight against us, there's nothing you can do about it. And eventually what they want these nations to conclude is, there's no point in fighting China because we can't win. The US is not gonna come to our defense. So we might as well cut a deal with them and accept their dominance. And that is their plan, slowly but surely, to change the facts on the ground, to assert themselves, to convince these other countries there's nothing they can do about it, they can't count on the US anymore, and eventually these countries will say, fine, China will do whatever you want, and cave.
That's their plan, and they're carrying it out. They've also shown their true colors in Hong Kong. You know, when that agreement was signed to turn Hong Kong over from the United Kingdom to the Chinese, one of the things that was important in that agreement was autonomy. That Hong Kong couldn't have its own foreign policy, but it could have its own domestic system of government autonomous from the Chinese system. But now things have changed. Now the Chinese basically want to have veto power over who can run for, for office and who can lead Hong Kong. In fact, the criteria they've established is you have to love the nation. But I'll translate to you what that means. You have to love the Chinese Communist Party and do what they want you to do. And so this is an important development that we need to keep an eye on. Beyond that, going back to military affairs for a moment, because we're on the NDAA, just look at what China's doing in its military expenditures. Dramatic increases in military expenditures, the true nature of which we don't know, because China doesn't pass a budget like ours for public knowledge. We know what they've spent, but we don't know how much more they've spent than what they've declared. But we can tell you they are developing anti-access denial weapons, anti-access weapons. They they've tested, for example, missiles, supersonic missiles fired off their ships, designed to penetrate U.S. missile defense. And here's why they develop these things, because they want us to know that if we were to somehow encroach upon these territories, on, if there was a conflict in Asia and the U.S. responded militarily, the Chinese can destroy one of our aircraft carriers. The Chinese could destroy one of our expensive naval capabilities. That's what they want to be able to prove to us. And what they hope the calculation will be is that the U.S. knows, look, if one day China invades Taiwan, there's nothing we can do about it because we're not going to lose two aircraft carriers over a conflict. So that's why they're investing so much in these denial capabilities. By the way, they're also investing in space warfare, the ability to blow up our satellites because they know how dependent American national security is on having a technological advantage. So China is racing to militarize space. Very serious threat to keep an eye on. A couple more points on the military. I want to close by talking about the Western Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere poses its own set of challenges, as outlined earlier. Let's start with Venezuela. We took up a bill this week on Venezuela. And it was an important bill, and I'm glad we passed it. It's on the way to the president's desk. It sanctions human rights violators. Venezuela, the government of Venezuela, is not an ally of the United States. They vote against this country in every international forum that they can. They actively undermine U.S. national security interests. And they're serial human rights violators at home. And we passed a bill that's going to sanction those human rights violators. The president has indicated he's going to sign them. And I think they're going to have a real impact. But Venezuela is headed for catastrophe. This is a rich country, by the way, headed for economic catastrophe. Basic goods like toothpaste and toilet paper are unavailable in Venezuela. The Venezuelan economy today resembles the Cuban economy. By the way, there's no embargo against Venezuela. It just shows you socialism doesn't work. They've run out of, way, they've run out of things to give away. It's not a democracy. Venezuela is no longer a democracy. They have something called the National Electoral Commission. And they are actively, as we speak, trying to replace people not loyal to the government on that commission with people loyal to the governing party. The second thing I predict you're going to see is the current president of Venezuela, Maduro, is going to move up the elections, the legislative elections, to July or June of this year. Because he knows the longer this crisis goes on, the less and less popular the governing party is going to be. So I predict the Venezuelan elections could be moved up. But I also predict financial disaster. In fact, here's a curious thing that we've received you know, calls about in the last few days. Venezuela is now begging, basically, the Petro-Caribe nations, the Mercosur nations, the Alba nations, to buy Venezuelan products. In fact, they're going to the Petro-Caribe nations and they're saying, instead of paying us back in cash for the oil we've given away to you, you can pay us by buying our products. There's going to be a financial disaster in Venezuela. The price of oil and its collapse is not helping them. And what I predict is not just financial disaster, but severe repression. And I predict in the year 2015, we're going to see severe human rights violations, severe repression on the part of the Maduro government, and everything that can, and all the impact that's going to have on the region. And I hope we're ready to confront that. It's something we need to begin to think about. Because that's going to lead to mass migration into Colombia, into the United States. 
That's going to lead to instability in the region. That could potentially lead to armed conflict between the professional armed services of Venezuela and the Cuban agents that now, for all intents and purposes, run the Cuban government. Talking about Cuba, a nation that I talk a lot about because my parents came from there. I live in a community of people who came from there and had to leave to flee communism. Let me begin by saying that Alan Gross is still a hostage. Alan Gross committed no crime. He did nothing wrong. He is a hostage in a Cuban prison. A hostage that the Cubans are holding because they want to exchange him for five Cuban spies convicted in the courts of the United States. Alan Gross was not a spy. All he wanted to do was help the small Jewish community in Cuba. And for that, he's been jailed. It's outrageous. It shows you the true nature of this government. We shouldn't be surprised. They still detain, on a, on a, on a, as a matter of course, they still detain dissidents and people that disagree. Every Sunday, they beat up and harass the ladies in white, which is a group of mothers who have sons in jail or fathers who have been killed or husbands who have been killed or jailed, who every Sunday march and dressed in white to protest the government, and every Sunday the government thugs come after them. It's shameful to me that people know this and look the other way, but that's the reality of what's happening every single day in Cuba. It's still going on. It is the most repressive government in the Western Hemisphere and one of the most repressive governments in the world. They're also a violator of international agreements. We know for a fact that a ship going through the Panama Canal from Cuba to North Korea was, was, was carrying equipment and material in violation of the UN sanctions on North Korea. The UN, which is not an easy place to get to condemn Cuba, found the exact same thing. And our response to that has been nothing. Absolutely nothing. The Cuban government assisted North Korea in evading UN sanctions. And we've done nothing about it. On the contrary, we still have people saying, let's lift the embargo, let's normalize relations, which leads me to some point directly related to this. The nomination of Tony Blinken that's before the Senate. I, th I will use every procedural method available to me to ensure that this Senate will have to take as long as possible to confirm him, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because on three separate occasions I asked Mr. Blinken, is the United States going to ignore the law of the United... Uh, is, is your government going to ignore U.S. law and unilaterally change policy towards Cuba? And he would not answer my questions. And so until I get a clear answer on that, I intend to hold his nomination as long and as, as the rules allow me to. I want to make one more point about Cuba. And that is, in addition to be the ally of every tyrant on the planet, from Assad to Iran to Gaddafi before he died and fell. They also, by the way, Cuba's the home of a significant number of Medicare fugitives, people that have come to the United States, stolen money through Medicare fraud. Medicare, that's a subject for another day, but Medicare fraud in South Florida is rampant. It is out of control. In fact, law enforcement officials in South Florida will tell you that if you're only willing to steal 200, if you're just willing to steal $200,000 a month, they will never catch you. You have an inordinate number of people coming from Cuba, stealing from Medicare, and then when they're about to get caught, they go back to Cuba with all that money. They are housing numerous Medicare fugitives in Cuba. And it's hard to believe that they came here and were able to mount such operations so quickly without, without assistance from somebody. So I would just say, and now we see signals from the White House that we're going to invite Cuba, that we're open to them being invited to the Summit of the Americas. The Summit of the Americas is a forum for democracies, not for 20th century relics like the Cuban government. And now all this talk of unilateral policy change, I want us to change policy towards Cuba, but the first step has to happen from the Cuban government. They have to change first. And let me tell you what would happen if we lifted the embargo on Cuba tomorrow. What would happen is what's happening now with China. You know, we passed a bill today out of foreign relations on the issue of Hong Kong, and I'm getting phone calls in my office from American companies who do business in China who are saying, hey, why don't you guys drop that? What they're really saying is, hey, why don't you guys drop that? It's bad for the deal we have going with the Chinese. That's the same thing that will happen if we lift the embargo. American companies will become invested in the, whatever deal the regime gets, gives them, and now they'll come to Washington, D.C. and lobby on behalf of the interests of that regime without any interest for the freedom 
and the liberty of the Cuban people. I hope and I will fight with every marrow in my bones against any sort of unilateral change to U.S. policy towards Cuba. From a military perspective, Cuba is not a benign country, although they don't have the military capability they once had. And in fact, there have been open source reports that Cuba is looking to restart with Russian cooperation an intelligence gathering station in the city of Lourdes in Cuba, whose sole purpose is to collect against the United States and particularly Southern Command in, in South Florida. So as we look at the NDAA, that's something to keep in mind. So I would close by four points that we should think about as we get into the new year and as we debate this bill on national security and national defense. The first is this. We should stop confusing tactics with strategy. We had a debate today in the Foreign Relations Committee about authorizing the use of military force. And everyone wants to debate tactics. Should it be for three years or one year? Should we have ground troops or not have ground troops? Should we define the geography of where it is or where it isn't? Tactics are not the same thing as strategy. And time and again around the world, many of these problems, this administration has not articulated a strategy. They're telling us what they're tactically doing. We're doing airstrikes. We're imposing sanctions. But they don't tell you what the strategy is. What is the strategy behind all these things? The strategy should be clear. We are in favor of a world that is free and a world that is prosperous, where more people than ever live in a prosperous middle class so they can buy the things we sell and invent and innovate and make and the services we offer. We want there to be peace and prosperity throughout the world, and we believe the best system for that is an international order that respects human rights and democracy and freedom of every, and the dignity of every individual. That's our overlying aim. And of course, the security of the United States is deeply tied to all of this. And then in each region of the world, we need to have a strategy. A strategy that, because it's backed up by strong national defense, tells our partners in Asia, we are here for the long haul. And not only are we here to pivot to Asia, we have something to pivot with through our military capability that tells NATO you still do have a purpose. And that purpose is to ensure the territorial integrity of the nations of Europe. A military strategy that tells our partners in the Middle East, we stand with you and we will do what we need to do to defeat radical jihadists and prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. And so that's important. The second thing is we have to spend money on these things. The sequester cuts to the military are unsustainable. At a time when the world has gotten more complicated, where the threats that this nation faces have gotten more complicated and more difficult to deal with than ever before, we are severely cutting back on military spending in an unsustainable way. In fact, no one believed that the budget cuts that we're facing in the military now were realistic or sane for that matter. That's why they put them in that bill that I voted against. Because they thought these budget cuts are so bad that it will force them to actually do something about the debt. They underestimated the willingness of this Congress to do bad things. Because those cuts are here to stay. And we have the smallest Air Force and Navy, at least since the end of World War II, while our potential adversaries are ramping up military spending and their military capabilities. My third point, directly related to national defense and national security. We cannot continue to try to erode our intelligence gathering capabilities. The threats that we face around the world are real and they are significant. They are threats from nation states like Russia and China. They are the threats of rogue states like Iran and North Korea. They are the threats of non-state actors like Al Qaeda and ISIL. And they are the threat of transnational criminal groups who steal the personal data of Americans and who could potentially conduct other cyber attacks against our infrastructure. These threats are real. And I hope the day will never come, but if it does, that another major attack occurs here in the homeland, perhaps one even worse than 9-11. The first question people are going to ask is, why didn't we know about it? And why weren't we able to stop it? And the answer cannot be because we took apart our intelligence gathering capability because we took down our ability to identify these threats. And we took them down because of conspiracy theories. Because we have people running around telling people that all your phone calls are being listened to. That all your cell phone calls are being tracked. That is false. That is categorically and patently false. That is not true. And yet we are prepared to dismantle our ability to acquire information that could prevent those sorts of attacks 
And by the way, intelligence capabilities that also give us a strategic advantage over potential adversaries and intelligence gathering capabilities that also inform our diplomacy, by the way. And yet there are people advocating to take that apart. In fact, just a day ago, we had someone come to the floor of the Senate and divulge classified information on the floor of the Senate. Unprecedented, outrageous, irresponsible, and unacceptable. And last but not least, we have to truly believe with all our heart that the world is a safer and better place when America is the strongest military power in the world. No nation is perfect. Ours never has claimed to be. But I know of no nation that has used its power more benevolently than ours. It is Americans who have sent its sons and daughters abroad to fight for the freedom and the liberty of other people. It is America that has gone abroad to fight against communism and radical Islam and Nazism and Imperial Japan and other threats to human dignity and the survival of mankind. And we did so without taking a single inch of territory. We didn't turn Iraq into the 51st state. We didn't turn Afghanistan into a US territory. This is the nation that after we defeated Japan and Germany in World War II, helped rebuild those countries. And today they are among our strongest allies. This is the country that even after a ceasefire in the Korean War still stands so many years later on the front lines with South Korea, protecting their freedom and their territorial integrity. To a point where South Korea, a nation that just two decades ago was a beneficiary of global aid, is now a donor. A country that has gone from being with an economy smaller than North Korea's, now has one of the top 10 economies in the world. This is the nation that did that. We're not perfect, but I challenge you to find another nation in human history that's used its military power for the good of mankind more than we have. And let me tell you, the world knows that too. And as we talk about national defense, it's not just about bombs and bullets. Let me close with a story that I picked up earlier this year when I traveled to Asia. I went to the Philippines to an area badly hit by the storm last year. This area was devastated. These people were already poor to begin with. The typhoon made things even worse. And I got to speak to some of the people there and I asked them, when, when did you finally know that there was hope? What was it that actually, was it when the humanitarian aid group showed up? Was it when the UN got here? When was it that you finally thought to yourself, there's something to live for, there's hope here? And a gentleman turned to me and said, you know when I knew that there was actually some hope? When I woke up one morning and looked to the horizon and there was a US aircraft carrier. That's when I started to believe that maybe we we're gonna make it. Maybe things were gonna be okay. That aircraft carrier didn't stay long, but it stayed long enough to make a difference in those early days after that storm. And it stayed long enough to give people hope. It's the same aircraft carriers they saw, off the they saw off the coast of Haiti after the terrible earthquake. It's the same aircraft carriers they saw off the coast of Japan after they had a nuclear accident. That's also America's military power. That's also what we've done with our national defense capabilities. We have not been perfect, but America has been a source for good in the world. No nation in the history of mankind has ever done more good for the planet than we have and for the people of this earth, and we should be proud of that. Now is not the time to dismantle that capability. The world needs a strong America today and now more than it ever has.